so the first one, if we're just going to go around, around in groups. Yeah, so we're going to group one, one first. So group one, can you name five absolute contraindications for the combined pillow ever patch? Well, five. Mm. <laughs> right. Um, breast cancer, quick breast cancer, um, focal migraine, BTE. Do you want me to go through them all, or am I just doing one? No, fine. No, 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 no. Um, active liver disease, BMI over 35. Okay. Group two, can you give us five absolute contraindications for the congestion known in pill, implant and depo probira? Mm -hmm. I'll give you two. Pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We've got pregnancy over 50s. Yeah. yeah. Undiagnosed bleeding. Yeah, kind of about the enzymes and juices. Less than three weeks postpartum. Uh, not the enzyme and juices. Because no, enzyme and juices is absolutely fine. So right. Right. No, well, but not fine with the implant, is it? All right, so yeah, okay, no. fair enough. Yeah. I accept yeah. that. So yeah. 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 Three, mm -hmm. three methods. Yeah. yeah, I suppose that, that was, yeah. Depot wasn't the only one that would be okay with the enzyme and juices. Okay. Let's come to group three. Oh, sorry. So you've got your you've got your pregnancy. Um, you're over fifties. You, your enzyme juices for your pill and your implant. And go on, what else did we have? Undiagnosed. Yeah, un, un, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Any sensitivities to any of the components of the drugs? Yeah, or under three weeks postpartum. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, porphyria for all hormones and um, systemic lupus. Yeah, SLE for any of those is also <laughs> lupus. Yeah, for all, any of the hormone methods. Yeah. Okay, so group three. Is that the fact that we have two additional absolute contraindications that apply just to depo? Diabetic with an opathy. Excellent! Woo! Uh, we did. Uh, we did. Age. Now, one of the others is multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Mm. Too long. It's it's long. Is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, okay. So, group four. What is the name of the POP that would be first choice of the young people starting on the POP and why? So we've put um, desigestrol, it's got a 12 hour window and it inhibits ovulation. Yeah, absolutely. So, so come back to the first group, so what's the name of the COC that is first time in starting the new plant with the COC and why? Estrogen, um, it's a lower risk of VTE, um, good efficacy and cost as well. Yeah. And there's more research on the monophasic levonorgestrels as well in terms of, you know, first line COC issue. Yeah. Okay, so we've got some scenarios. So, so we've done that bit. We've done that bit. So, we have group one, are going to do scenario one. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So if I read it out, a young girl of 17 attends clinic wanting her implant removed. She's had her implant fitted eight months ago and initially had no bleeding. However, in the last month she's had bleeding every day. Medically she's fit and well, although she tells you she's had one focal mode migraine two years ago, but none since. And she's got a new boyfriend of two months. So what do we do? Screener. <laughs> <laughs> and what else? Take a full medical history. Um, we'd question a little bit more probably about that focal migraine, even though it wouldn't necessarily mean that she had to come off the implant because it looks as though it was aged, do you know what I mean, prior to. Um, yeah, screening, um, possibly discuss with the doctors um, about second clinician in Sorel, um, if that's what you wanted. And if you start on that, nothing resolves about a bleeding um, examination, if it's unresolved. Okay. I'm going to ask Anybody else? any other the counter medication or change the medication that might interfere. Anybody else? Yeah, brilliant. Anything else? Yeah.
But but I mean the thing being here is that she initially had no bleeding. Yeah. So when we were talking about the transmembranes mm. in their size, it was when they've had the bleeding from the outset mm -hmm. and um, it hasn't settled. Whereas this she initially had no bleeding and it's only in the last month. So she's had seven months of no bleeding. So what you need to do is look at why we suddenly started bleeding now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that uh, she'd been on death pole before she had yeah. as well. Yeah. And this is it. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had a girl yeah. in the last yeah. week. Yeah. I've had a, la a young girl in the last week, more or less, this is her really. Um, no bleeding, and then started bleeding. I prescribed COC and she was fine on that, and then started bleeding on that thing in the second month of her, of her pack. Um, she never came back to me to discuss it. She went to a GP who gave her methanemic acid within 24, 48 hours, the bleed had stopped. She's since come back to me for more COC, funny enough. But still, you know, she'd gone there and she'd had that break where she'd been amenorrheic and then gone on to COC. So it just depends what works for who, but yeah, it can work both ways, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so two. two. A girl aged 15 attends the clinic requesting contraception. She's medically fit and well. However, I'm taking her family medical history. She states her mum was treated for breast cancer age 40 and her dad has high blood pressure. She's been going out with her boyfriend Danny for four months. He's 17 years old. We want to know when she came in uh, whether she was actually sexually active, whether she ever had been sexually active. If she wasn't sexually active, then that would be a big discussion point as to kind of is the pressures to be having sex, etc. Obviously, if she's had previous sex, was that protected or unprotected? And then obviously we'll be considering the contraception. Was the chlamydia test possibly? Do we need to be doing the pregnancy test? We would do a full medical history. Obviously, the mum, age 50, sorry, age 40 with breast cancer and all that business. And how old, we don't know how old the dad is. And what are her thoughts on contraception? Obviously, we would be strongly pushing towards a mark. Phrasing guidelines. Yeah. Phrasing guidelines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> are there any there that you wouldn't offer? No. Not really. She hasn't had the brackets. Yeah. 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 And even the dad's high blood pressure, it doesn't really matter what age, it's not a contraindication. Yeah. So she could have any of the choices that she wanted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The scenario three, group three, a 45 year old lady attends the clinic for a further depo injection. She's been on the depo for 10 years. She's overweight with a BMI of 36 and smokes 10 a day. Although you notice that a new history has not been completed for several years, she is happy with the methods as she has a memory. So, um, first thing to say is that she um, mm -hmm. needs a full medical history now because she's not had one for a while. <laughs> and that would also need to consider whether or not she's had a new sexual partner, partner in that time, so she might. Be appropriate to be screened. Um, she's entitled to the, the depot, but would be she's approaching menopause, so um, and she's only four years off not being able to have the depot in it anymore. So we need to enter, we think, at some point, the general discussion um, in relation to the menopause. Um, if we get her off, then it give her time to um, build a bit of bone density prior to uh, prior to the menopause. Um, there are. The myrena coil um, might re is a reduced amount of hormone, was it? Yeah, less hormone. Less hormone, so that she's more likely to lose a bit of weight on that. In relation to the weight uh, and the smoking, so general lifestyle uh, advice might be useful. Um, we would see if she has any menopausal symptoms. Um, and So, so again, really, uh, the big thing again is also that we've got to remember that smoking yeah. also has an effect on bone mineral density. So it's that big thing of trying to get her off the method. Um, for if she wanted to, could she stay on it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the final one. This was a bit unfair on group four because we haven't done emergency contraception yet. But there we go. That's this is going to test their knowledge. Um, or background knowledge. <laughs> a 23 year old attends the clinic wanting hormonal method contraception. She's in a new relationship and has been using condoms but not consistently. <coughs> and taking the history, you discover she's mid cycle and had unprotected sexual intercourse 100 hours ago. 
She has also recently investigated for excess acid and is now taking a So, well, she's mid cycle. So, um, the most effective emergency contraception that we would offer would be L1. She's over 70 hours, so it's in our PGD, so we can do uh, L1. Uh, but she's on a meprazole, so if she's going to be sick in the next three hours, we need to make sure that that's, that's repeated. We were talking, we discussed IUD as well to offer her that, but because we're not too sure about her, um, the safety of the, the condom, she's not consistent with using, the, using the condom, so it's not a reliable method of contraception. But we could explore that, whether um, it's in um, five days of a unprotected intercourse or previous inter intercourse or whether she's up to day 19 uh, in a cycle if she's got a 28 day cycle um, so we also want to look at quick starting her on something as well if we've given her the L1 depending on her uh, medical history uh, if we quick started her on the POP then we would want to make sure that she was going to have additional contraception or not have sex for 9 days or uh, 14 days if we put her onto the COC. We also want to do a, a STI screen as well. We want to check for uh, Did we say anything else? I think we could. Does anybody else want to add anything? Yeah. about I know. I, I, I thought the omeprazole had anything to do. You need yeah. to change your time. Omeprazole's got a pharmacokinetic element, so it actually reduces the absorption of the L1 in the gut, so you can have less L1 bioavailability in the body. So we need to really think about level now rather than L1. Ah, oh, we did think about discussion about it. Yeah, yeah it's a proton. Well, that was a trick, really. So, yeah. That was a bit yeah. of a main <laughs> trick. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 I should probably give her the other one and see if it actually really be pushing the IUD. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Any questions for us? Oh. Would it would it matter what time she'd take? No, because she's on it. She's on it regularly. So As I understand it, it's a, it's, it's, a, a, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's um, one of the contraindications sure. within our PGD. Yeah. There's mm. always going to be an element of it reducing the efficacy of LO1. So you were saying about three hours ago I gave LO1 um, and it was only then that I read about the... Um, you should have got this one. The Emeprazole. Um, yes, I was reading about that, but no, I was reading, uh, I was reading both. It's only then, so if you don't read the PGD, because then, I don't, you're not going to read this stuff, I'm going to read this. <laughs> You will now, David. You will now. <laughs> 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 you got that. Well, there's your evaluation. That's your evaluation for the day. I know what you mean about what that's on the PGD. It's on the PGD, so basically, if you're unsure, you have to check your PGD. And all the PGDs, am I correct, Caroline, are on the shared drive? They are. Yes. And every clinic is going to have. Full but you can have a hard copy of each clinic and then you're at the outreach nurses with their copies don't they? Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. And basically, if in doubt, check your PGD. And if you're still in doubt, bring it down to <laughs> Right, so I'm now doing um, emergency contraception. Um, and this is any method that is administered after sex, but it works prior to implantation and we generally say that implantation occurs five days or more after ovulation and there's your three methods your copper coil your olipristal acetate and your levonorgestrel and there they are listed for you the new ones that's coming out the level now is different it's Crystal, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that having that up in made me think of Bristol, so just be aware of that. Again, maybe it's sticking to generics is a good yeah. idea. Okay, so here um, you've got 1,000 women, and all of these 1,000 women have unprotected sex. 
all these women here don't use any form of contraception. So 80 of them become pregnant. However, 10 of the blue women have levonorgestrel, gestural, such as Levinel. And if they had instead had olecrystal acetate, such as Ella one only five rather than ten would have become pregnant. If they'd all had a copper coil fitted, <coughs> only one out of the 1,000 would become pregnant. Okay, so um, a little bit more about that later. This takes you back to your student days, probably. So here we have, that's the endometrium. This is the egg releasing, or the follicle, um, and that's ovulation. This here is the hormones, particularly there, the luteinizing hormone. So any method of emergency hormonal contraception works prior to ovulation. So it's working prior to an ovulation that has not yet happened. And to be effective, it's got to be able to delay that ovulation by at least five days. <laughs> um, the nearer it gets to ovulation that you're giving the emergency hormonal contraception, the less effective your hormonal method is. And if you're talking about your levonorgestrel, 11L, then when you get to here, where the luteinizing hormone surge begins, it stops working. And that's probably somewhere around 34, 38 hours prior to ovulation. However, your olecrystal acetate, we know, will work while that surge is happening and probably to just a few hours before ovulation. Your copper coil will work around here because it affects fertilisation, but will also work to prevent implantation, which will be around here. So this is in, in table form, looking at where the various methods work. Question mark here. From the uh, chemical makeup, a progesterone um, receptor modulator, or a crystal acetate, we would think that possibly it would have some effect on the endometrium and might um, interfere with implantation. But again, hasn't been proven, but possibly will. Um, and again, this is the timing. That's before, so let's say two days prior um, to ovulation, that even our gestural will work, whereas a few hours before for your other crystal acetate. One thing that's really quite important and probably should be at the forefront uh, when we're giving the emergency hormonal methods of contraception is that, as I said before, it's working by delaying ovulation. It's not stopping it, it's delaying it. So if you're giving it here, what effectively you're doing is making that ovulation occur five to seven days later. And Possibly that needs to be um, in your mind and part of your counselling, mm -hmm. that she's going to be at risk later in her cycle than she would um, otherwise be. Is everyone okay with this? So again, this is um, uh, leave gestural working up to um, probably about a couple of days before, or a crystal acetate to just before, but both in the first half of the cycle prior to ovulation, and a, a coil working any time um, up to five days after the predicted date of ovulation, which is day 19 in your regular 28-day cycle. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. So, the methods, um, leave no gestural, one tablet as soon as possible, off-license use up to 120 hours, more and more doubt whether it has any effect after 96 hours, um, works by delaying ovulation uh, and 
no effect after ovulation. PGD, there's no UK MEC 3 and 4. Your exclusions in your PGD are hypersensitivity, such as a previous severe adverse reaction, lactose intolerant patients. And if they say they've just got a mild lactose intolerance, so do have some... Well, I would say yes, but it's that cycle of PGD. Yeah, same PGD. Same is for the oligosterastate, actually. Is it? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, in, outside of licence but included in your PGD, repeated use, enzyme inducing drugs where you give double dose, once again, that applies to 28 days after they've finished their enzyme inducers. And we do allow it up to 120 hours if oligocrystal acetate is contraindicated. But there's always that doubt, isn't it, if you're giving Smarties or whether you're giving something that's having some effect, particularly if it's after 96 hours, particularly if it's after ovulation has occurred in the cycle. Olicrystal acetate. Um, as I said before, it um, affects the progesterone receptors, inhibits or delays ovulation more effectively than levonorgestrel, up to 120 hours after unprotected sex or failure of a method. Throughout the 120 hours, it appears to be equally effective. That's not the same for levonorgestrel. And because of that fact, um, it's particularly more effective um, in the last 24 hours of the 120 hours because we just know that um, levonorgestrel probably isn't doing anything. Exclusions. You can only give it once per cycle. Because we don't know for definite how it affects the pregnancy, you can't give it if there's previous risk of pregnancy in that cycle prior to your 120 hours. Severe asthma that's not controlled sufficiently by steroids. Severe liver impairment. I came in on the last one so you know about <laughs> things that um, affect gastric pH, including omeprazole. Um, can't use with enzyme-inducing drugs and in the following 28 days. And again, hypersensitivity to any of the ingredients. And there's a list of drugs also in your PGD, but it will almost certainly say refer to uh, BNF, um, because obviously there's additions all the time. Lactose intolerance again. Porphyria recruits in everywhere. <laughs> right. Um, so you can't reassure a woman who becomes pregnant that the pregnancy is going to be okay. It gets into the breast milk because it's lipophilic. And so you have to tell her not to breastfeed for seven days, which is actually quite, it's, that's quite disruptive, isn't it? So that might come into your decision-making process when we get the PGD where you can use both any time. Three times as expensive. But overall, it's probably, um, if you take everything into account, it becomes more cost effective because it reduces your pregnancies, etc. It does decrease the contraceptive efficacy of ongoing hormonal methods. Uh, we're not advised to give both concurrently. So if, um, let's say if a pharmacist contacts you because he wants to give olipristal acetate, you wouldn't advise him to give the levonorgestrel just in case because they may interact with each other. One's a, um, because of the progesterone receptor effect. Say that again, please. Um, levonorgestrel yeah, is a... Said, in the pharmacy's phone, you're going to say what? Um, sometimes, yeah. it's more doctors than nurses, yeah. you get a pharmacist who hasn't got a PGD yeah crystal acetate saying this girl is mid-cycle yeah. and I don't think um, I think she needs something more effective than what I can give her mm -hmm. um, now if it's for a copper coil we always mm -hmm. say don't we give it mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. and we'll sort her out for the coil mm -hmm. um, but you wouldn't do that in the case of the pharmacist saying I think she wants a more effective hormonal method but doesn't want a coil um, because the two um, ingredients they work very differently and could actually reduce the efficacy
Yeah. So if they've had leaving a guest rule that say two days earlier mm. for an unprotected sex and come back and have had further unprotected sex, could you you can't then give the unit crystal mm. acetate? It probably would be better to give uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it's concurrent use. Um, that is a contraindication indication in your PGD and previous risk of so. so, probatic approach. Um, this is the time that the efficacy of the either the quick start or the ongoing hormonal method may be affected by. So, any method that works by um, suppressing ovulation, it's the seven days that the olaprystal acetate is actually in the bloodstream, plus the seven days that the method will then become effective, and that makes a total of 14 days. For your methods that work by mucus thickening, such as the POP, because it only takes 48 hours for the mucus thickening to take place, you've got your seven days that your own crystal acetate is in the bloodstream, adding on your 48 hours for your mucus thickening effect. Everyone okay with that? Um, briefly, the copper coil. Um, as we know, most effective, up to five days after, after a single episode of unprotected sex, any time in a cycle, you can fit a coil up to five days after, regardless of when that is. For a woman with a regular cycle, and if she hasn't got a regular cycle, you've got to abide her shortest cycle, it can be fitted up to five days after the predicted date of ovulation, and that covers however many episodes of unprotected sex prior to that in that particular cycle. Failure rate less than 1%, can be used for ongoing contraception. The usage is low in FP clinics, um, about 3%. Um, okay, I'm now over to you, so you can tell me all of this. Uh, COC, uh, when will she require emergency contraception? Two or more. Two or more, yeah. Uh, at what point in there? Well, unless she's had seven days, seven pills days. before. Yeah. 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 Two or more in the first seven, seven days. days. Yeah. 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 And if she missed those two in the last seven days, no. carry, on. Carry, on. carry on and. Miss her. Yeah, we're unpacking this together. Wonderful. So I think we've got there. Yeah, and if, again, two missed pills is the same as starting 48 hours late, isn't it? So take the recent pill as soon as possible, remain your pills as you should do. Condoms and abstain for seven days. As we know, mid-cycle, that's a bit overcautious, mm -hmm. but that's in case she misses future pills. Um, and if more than two pills in the first seven days, then she's at risk. That's seven days. Mm -hmm. Skip the pill-free week. Ephra. Yeah, it's the, same, it's the same as combined pill, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if in her seven day, bearing that in mind, her seven day break with the Evra patch, how long can she make that, if she forgets to put it back on again, how long can she go before she is at risk of pregnancy? Nine days. Nine days. And, and if she forgets to change her patch, same again, how long does she leave her patch on before she becomes at risk of pregnancy? Nine, 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 nine days. Nine. So that's the same again, isn't it? 48 both ways, mm -hmm. extending the uh, patch-free week and um, forgetting to take the patch off. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's just what you've said. Now then. <laughs> Noovering. Refer to doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor's not available. Wait till Come doctor's back. available. <laughs> Needs to know now. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's been nine days, not it? Is it not the same?
it's no. It's three weeks. Yeah, three the ring stays in for 21 days. Yeah. Right. So, um, I mean, you can always go to go to the FPA leaflet on the shelf. It's in there anyway. But how long? Just have a guess if you don't know. How long do you think she could leave it in and still be okay for? Nine, 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 nine days. Nine days after the three weeks. Thirty days. What? No, thirty days. Another forty-eight hours after. No, not thirty. It'd be twenty-one. I think. Can I tell you not to be too logical? Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm two days after the twenty-one. I'm just going to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. In the SPC um, and the FPA leaflet, it says you're okay um, if you leave it in up to 28 days. So that's in the right. yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you remember in that time, um, then uh, what you do then is then have your seven day break. If you go over that time, um, you can put a new one in if you want, but you're not covered for another seven days, just like you would with a combined pill. But it's, it, so you allow seven more days over the 21. Okay. It's a bit more complicated than that, but I'm not going there um, because you can read the leaflet. Yeah. Okay. Give it just a quick minute just to read that. It just reinforces what we just said, and I'll just move on. Right, POP. Let, let's just go for desuggestral. Okay, so how many do you have to miss? One. 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 By more than 12, 12 hours. hours. Yeah. yeah. Cover after? Two days. 48, 48 hours. hours. 48 hours, yeah. yeah. Some people, again, uh, going by the fact that it suppresses ovulation, prefer to say seven days. The FPA leaflet says 48 hours. Yeah. Depot. Late by 14. Yeah. IUD. Um, this is probably an, a dislodged IUD or removed IUD. How many? How many days? Seven, yeah. Previous seven days, yeah. IUS. Um, okay, this is just how long it is effective for contraception for, so that you wouldn't need emergency contraception. So, IUS duration of use? Until years. Unless? Five, so, five years. Unless you're over what age? 45. Yeah, 45 for the IUS. And then it's effective for at least seven years, provided she's amenorrheic. Yeah. And again, um, menopause, a woman around time for menopause, how long does she need contraception for? If she's over 52 years. Other way around. Yeah. yeah. Under 52 years. Yeah. 50, yeah. Over 50, only one year. You get a lot of people asking you about how they know yeah. if they're going through the Well, this is judged by the last period, unless it's a woman who's on a method that causes her not to have periods, and then you're relying on symptoms and blood tests, the FSH, aren't you? And the FSH, three months apart. Well, two or three months apart, and more than 30 on both occasions. And can they keep on their pill? Does that affect the FSH? Um, a pill that is progesterone only and doesn't contain any oestrogen will not affect the FSH. So your and things like that, that They won't affect the FSH, no. So sonar is disrupted. I don't think anyone really uses it these days. I, I get that impression. No. Postpartum use, when do you require emergency contraception from? Yeah. Lovely. Um, and you, you start your method, don't you, on day 21, so it becomes effective by the earliest date of ovulation, which is around day 28. If you start it later than day 21, you need cover. The combined hormone for seven days. Breastfeeding, lactational amenorrhea. Well, it's fully breastfeeding. Fully breastfeeding. Under six months. Under six months. <coughs> Under six months. <coughs> Under six months. <coughs> Under six months. Amenorrhea. Yeah, 98% effective. 
So you're also, you're also so good these days, aren't you? Okay, so we've just covered all those three criteria. However, some women may still yeah. want to take yes. webinars. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. And older women, I think we've just said. <laughs> uh, women with amenorrhea coming for emergency contraception. Depends on the cause of their name. Amen. Yeah, well, it's in your PGD, as long as you exclude pre-existing pregnancy by pregnancy tests done three weeks after the last risk. And just briefly, these are the things that you need to advise her on. Um, I think all these are listed in your PGD. So vomiting for two hours, that's your leaving or gestural. It's three, three hours in your olaprystal acetate PGD. Next bleed may be not at the expected time, particularly it may be delayed. Uh, need for a pregnancy test if she's more than seven days late. Um, Abdominal pain, risk of ectopic pregnancy is slightly more likely if she's had emergency contraception because um, all methods um, of emergency contraception are better at dealing with intrauterine um, pregnancies. Um, STI screening, testing, I know you're all aware of that. Um, repeated use of EHC um, is disruptive. Um, and it's not a good method of contraception. She needs to get something else sorted, hopefully. And again, well, we often do our quick starts, don't we? Um, and then this is just my, my last slide, which is just um, ectopic pregnancy. Um, it's not that much of an issue with hormonal methods. However, with an intrauterine method of emergency contraception, if she becomes pregnant, the risk of ectopic is 1 in 20. She needs an ultrasound scan. That's for intrauterine methods. Why, why does a coil increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy? It doesn't increase it. It reduces the risk of all pregnancy, right. both intra- and extrauterine. But it's particularly good at reducing the risk of intrauterine pregnancy, so you've got a higher, you've got a higher relative risk right, yeah, yeah. of ectopic yeah. pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. So if she becomes pregnant, it's more likely right. to be ectopic. Yeah. And I think I'm now handing over to Caroline. So welcome to Cumbria, and right page down. So. Um, I've got the honour of talking to you about adrenaline. This is the exciting bit. This is your chance to save a life. Um, um, and I've taken most of the guidelines from the Recess um, Council UK's 2008 guidelines. So that's where these come from. Um, just let me go down one. Adrenaline is actually the um, drug of choice for anybody who's having an anaphylactic reaction. It's a severe... Um, life-threatening condition. It's a severe allergic reaction that's life-threatening. And it's very difficult to actually diagnose an anaphylactic reaction because it might be a panic attack, it might be somebody fainting. But basically, you're going to assess by ABC, airway, breathing and circulation. And the airway, you often get very... Um, you get swelling around the mouth, um, throat... Um, the voice um, might be um, hoarse, um, you might have a strider. Um, the patient often feels that their throat is closing up. Um, breathing, shortness of breath, uh, wheezing. The patient might suddenly feel very tired. They might be a bit confused because of hypoxia. Um, and they might actually have a respiratory arrest. Circulation, signs of shock, pale and clammy, um, including um, kind of tachycardia, um, what else, uh, low blood pressure, re reduced level of consciousness again, uh, possible cardiac arrest. If you kind of think this person's having an anaphylactic reaction, you are going to call for help straight away. That's the first thing you do. You can carry on with your assessment, but you need to get help. Um, it's a very uh, sudden onset and rapid progression usually tells you that it's anaphylaxis. Um, you know, that, that life-threatening airway, breathing, circulation, um, 
you get skin and mucosal changes, not always, but they might come up in hives, they might be flushing. Um, sometimes it's very subtle, so you can't always tell that, but you know, if somebody's seriously ill, and if you think they might be having uh, anaphylaxis, you get that help, you get the adrenaline into them straight away. If somebody's breathing, you would get them into the um, recess position. Just remember, if you've got a pregnant lady, you'd lie her on her left side um, to prevent uh, cable compression. Um, so causes of anaphylaxis, uh, main causes are actually food, drugs and um, stings. And stings come up really high there. And in food, it tends to be um, nuts is a, is a big one. And on this thing, we've got um, latex, which actually isn't a massive cause of um, uh, severe anaphylaxis, but it seems to be on that list. Does anybody have any idea how many deaths we have from anaphylaxis in the UK on average every year? It's about 20 a year on average, so it's less than 1% of all, all, all the cases of anaphylaxis are usually fatal, and then um, usually if they're going to die, they usually die fairly quickly um, after coming into um, contact with the trigger. It's, but, you know, uh, and the stuff that we're giving, you know, I suppose the most dangerous thing that we give to people is actually the antibiotics. Um, it's not particularly the vaccines. The vaccines are, you know, people are less likely to have a, an anaphylactic reaction to that. So, um, all right. So, as I said, adrenaline's a treatment of um, choice. It's uh, an alpha receptor agonist. So basically, it refer reverses peripheral dilation. And um, sorry, yeah. So that would so. Um, Yes, this is relevant. So it reverses your um, peripheral dilation and it reduces edema. Um, and it's beta receptor activity. It opens up the airways. It increases the force of the heart muscle. Um, and it suppresses the histamine release, which um, causes all this kind of vasodilation, all that kind of thing, and, and also suppresses leukotriene uh, release. And then next slide, we're going on to... Uh, you need to do your annual update for anaphylaxis, but actually... You don't have to be signed up to the PGD to give adrenaline because it is a life-saving drug. But we'd like you to be signed up to the PGD because it just gives some structure and we know who's had the training. So it, it's good from that point of view. Um, so inclusion criteria on the PGD is, you know, anybody having anaphylactic reaction. Exclusion criteria, <laughs> previous known allergy to adrenaline. Um, <laughs> theoretically, if somebody was allergic to adrenaline, they wouldn't be alive because it's a naturally occurring product in the body. So it might be some excipient that's in the solution, but it's very unlikely to be adrenaline. And if you think somebody's having um, an anaphylactic reaction, you're going to shove that adrenaline in because you do not have a choice about what else you're going to do. You haven't got time to go and talk to Dr. Greenwood because that patient is dying. So you just put the injection in. You can whack it straight through their clothing. Um, you don't need to worry about getting anything off. You just whack it into the anterior <coughs> lateral um, aspect, mid thigh, just there, and um, stick it in. And it's um, the Caroline. I think people are looking. Can you point to where? Oh, sorry. So kind of there. All the health visitors will know because they put it there on the babies. So basically, as I say, you don't need to get their jeans off or whatever. Just stick it in. So these are the doses. So, um, greater than 12 years, you're giving half a mil. Um, if you've got a, a, a small or pre-pubertal 12-year-old, then you'd give 0.3. But basically, 6 to 12 years, you're giving 0.3 of a mil. Under 6 years, 0.15. And I put the younger ones on because it may well be the baby of the mother who's having the procedure, who's having the anaphylactic reaction, not necessarily the mother. So, yeah, we do need to know how to um, save anybody. Blue needle is good for all patients of all ages on the whole. Um, if you've got an obese client, then you go for a green needle. So that's a woman over 90 kilograms or a man over 118. And you're not going to weigh them. You're going to look at them and think, is this needle going to go into their muscle? <laughs> really important to get it into the muscle um, because if it doesn't get into the muscle, it's not going to do the job. Um, and... Well, that's it basically let's just go on to adverse effects yeah they might have a bit of tachycardia because they've almost died um, but also that's what adrenaline does um, hypertension because we're reversing stuff anxiety, tremor, sweating, nausea um, if they do have any of these then we're supposed to let the NHRA know by the yellow card system 
So that's it, basically. And that's that the... Go to uh, A &E or something. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they need to be followed up. They yeah, need to be seen yeah. by... Even and, and if it proves not to be, aren't they? You don't know. Yeah, they have to go on and have blood tests yeah. and see an allergy. You know, somebody specialising yeah. in allergies. Yeah. And, and if, uh, if the adrenaline can wear off, it's got a short half yeah. life. So you can think, yeah, they're all right now. They yeah, can go back yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, definitely need to go to any. You're more likely to survive though if it's been six hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, right. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Okay. So we'll go on to lidocaine. Um, so, we're giving this to women having um, local anaesthetic before their implant, um, insertion or removal. Um, and it's a sodium channel blocker, so it stops the electrical current going along the nerve pathways to the brain. So, the brain's not aware of the pain that's going on. Um, so, exclusion criteria are all up here. So, epilepsy, hepatico respiratory impairment, da, 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 you can all read, so I don't need to do that. The one that isn't on there is um, patients on antipsychotics. So, I presume we'd come and talk to Dr. Greenwood about that because that can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. Some of them. Yeah. 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 So, basically, you know, if they can't. If we can't give it, then we need to speak to a doctor and hopefully we'll find another local anaesthetic that we can use so that we can go on and do that implant. Um, a small amount may get into the breast milk, but we give such small doses. I mean, a, a woman who weighs 60 kilograms, um, she could ha actually have 18 mils of um, lidocaine before she, you know, it's an excessive dose. And we're not giving any more than two mils. But you do need to bear in mind that if it goes into the breast milk, it can cause an allergic reaction in the infant. So she needs to be aware that that's a possibility. But it's not really going to cause any massive problems. No, is it? no, it's just counselling the woman. I think I get quite a few phone calls, mainly from Rosie, I think, <laughs> uh, putting implants in, in breastfeeding women. Is that right, Rosie? Mm. Um, and it's just counselling, sometimes it's a rash in the baby. Um, but not usually much else. Right guys, we've got okay. two minutes, so we've got to get this done. So as I said, you can actually give a lot before you cause toxicity. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. And uh, side effects are rare, and you'd have to give a lot. And often it's because people inject into a blood vessel rather than uh, just into, you know, um, subdermally. Um, and I think at the doses we're giving, we're very, very unlikely to have any of these things unless it's an allergic reaction, basically. Um, and yeah, adverse reactions are rare and it's just a question of giving it and also any nurse that gives lidocaine must have recess equipment and know how to use it and that's basically it. Oh yes, and can we document any reactions um, and uh, especially on um, Lily as in Minnie had a reaction mouse so that we're all aware of it and there's the guidelines. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.